Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with pate de campagna. That's right, this is the video the charcuteries do not want you to see. Because when people find out that country pate they've been charging $30 a pound for is really nothing more than cold meatloaf, well, you can imagine what will happen. Millions of Americans will continue not to buy that pate. But above and beyond saving a few dollars, I think this is a really fun project. And I thought this really came out tasting great. So as they say, let's go ahead and get this pate started right by tossing several different meats into a mixing bowl, which will include a whole bunch of pork shoulder that I cut up into like one inch pieces. And then to that, I'm gonna add some duck meat, which I've trimmed off a couple large legs. Since we're doing a country style pate, some type of game bird would be very traditional in this. Okay, so our pate base is gonna be pork and duck, but we also need to include a very healthy dose of fat. And today I'm gonna to be using some diced up bacon, but some pork belly would also work. And we'll go over all your fat options on the blog post. And then of course it would not be a real pate unless we add a little bit of liver. And while pork liver would be more traditional, I'm gonna use chicken livers, which I've chopped up kind of roughly to make them look even more disgusting. So before people turn off the video, let's go ahead and cover those with a diced onion, as well as some sliced shallots and minced garlic. We will also toss in some freshly chopped parsley, at which point it's time to season this up with what looks to be a dangerous amount of kosher salt. But don't worry, it's the perfect amount. And then besides regular salt, we're also going to add a little bit of pink salt. And no, not pink Himalayan salt, pink curing salt, which you may or may not have purchased for our ham video. So that's optional, but if you do have it, we'll toss a little bit in. And then we're definitely also going to need to toss in a spoon of pate spice. And you might be thinking, hey, I don't have that. It's okay, nobody does. Which is why we make our own by combining the following four ingredients. Some ground ginger, a whole bunch of freshly grated nutmeg, some ground clove, and some type of ground pepper, usually white or black. But we're going to shock the world by using cayenne. And we'll give that a mix. And that's it. You are now the proud owner of some pate spice. Which, by the way, is great in so many other things. Which, unfortunately, we don't have time to review. Because we need to finish this off with some freshly ground black pepper. As well as a nice big splash of brandy. Or I guess cognac, if you want to waste the good stuff. But, of course, that's up to you. You guys are the Billy Mays of your country-style pates. Which reminds me, never buy anything for the kitchen that you see in an infomercial. Usually that's a bad idea, especially if it slices and dices things. But anyway, once we have all those ingredients together, we'll go ahead and give that a thorough mixing, at which point we're going to wrap it up and pop it in the fridge to marinate for about two hours. Okay, some people like to go overnight, but I don't. I think a couple hours is perfect. So we'll go ahead and wrap that up and pop it in the fridge. And while we're waiting for that, we can go ahead and make the next component, the panade. And for that, we will start with some plain dry breadcrumbs, to which we will add a couple large eggs, which appear to be very excited they're in this. And then we'll finish up with some heavy cream, and that's it. We will give that a mix. And that's what we're going to add to our meat later to help bind it together, as well as help provide that beautiful tender texture we're going for. And when you first mix this, it's going to look kind of thin, but as it sits on the counter for a few minutes, it's going to thicken up quite a bit. As you'll see when we add it to our ground meat, which, by the way, is the next step. And as you might know, one of the keys to successful meat grinding is to use very, very cold meat. So what we're going to do is transfer this onto a sheet pan, and we'll pop that in the freezer for, I don't know, about 15 or 20 minutes, at which point it's probably going to look something like this. And we certainly don't want this frozen solid, but it should be very, very cold to the touch and starting to firm up a little bit. And I think using very cold meat is important no matter how you grind it, but especially if you're going to use the grinding attachment on your stand mixer which isn't really exactly heavy duty. But having said that, if your meat is properly prepped, this does do a very decent job. I do try to make sure I keep that plate in front of the blade cleaned off, but other than that, there's not much to do except pass it through. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not gonna show a lot of this grinding footage since nobody should have to look at this longer than necessary. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and coarsely grind our meat. And by the way, if you don't have one of these machines, there's other ways you can do it, which I will be happy to outline in the post. And then what we're going to do once our meat's ground is toss in our fruit and nuts. And I'm going to be going with some dry cherries and pistachio. And since that's our garnish, we want those pieces whole, which is why we didn't grind them. And by the way, these are optional. You don't have to put them. But we are doing a country-style pate. And if you've ever been to the country, you know there's lots of fruits and nuts. And then once we've added whatever we're garnishing with, we will finish this off by mixing in our panade, which, as predicted, has gotten very thick. So we'll go ahead and transfer that in and mix it until combined. And I say mix, but it's really more of a fold. Because as with working with any kind of ground meat, we really don't want to overwork this if we can avoid it. So we'll kind of stir and mix and fold that together. 
And then what we'll do once that's been accomplished is transfer this into some kind of fat lined mold. And for a mold I'm using a bread pan and for fat I'm using bacon. I really do like to use call fat and that is more traditional, but I didn't have any and the bacon really does work nicely. And then as you may have guessed, we're gonna go ahead and fill that to the top with our mixture. And yes, I might have a little too much, but that's okay. And by the way, please make sure whatever you're using is long enough to overlap because we are gonna add a few pieces to the bottom. I mean, it's the top now, but it will be the bottom. And then once we have our meat transferred in and successfully encased with bacon, I'm gonna add a little piece of parchment paper over the top. And then we'll wrap that nice and tightly with foil, preferably heavy duty, at which point we will transfer that into some kind of deep pan or Dutch oven. And in case you're wondering, that was just a little silicone pot holder that I put at the bottom for a little insulation, but it's probably not necessary. It just seemed like a cool thing to do. And then once that's placed in, we want to partially fill that up with hot water. Just hot tap water is fine. And we want to fill that up somewhere between halfway up the pan and, oops, I went too far. So I usually shoot for about two-thirds of the way up our mold. And then because the other secret to this is cooking it to a very specific doneness, I'm going to go ahead and insert one of these probe thermometers before we put the lid on. And that's going to ensure we cook this to the perfect internal temperature. So we will go ahead and place that in. And then pop on the lid. At which point we will very carefully transfer this into the center of a preheated 350 degree oven for about two hours or so, or more importantly, until it reaches an internal temp of 155. And we really do want to go by temperature here because there are so many variables that will affect the cooking time. So for me, this took about an hour and 40 minutes. And then what we'll do once it comes out and we remove it from that pan is let it cool down. And because I filled mine so much, it was actually coming up above the top of the pan. So for now, I'm just going to press it down with this heavy cast iron baking dish. And I should mention, if you didn't overfill yours, you could just skip to the next step, which is the official way we're going to press this while it cools. And the reason we're doing this is so things compact a little bit, and we end up with a little firmer and what most people would consider nicer texture. And by the way, in case you're wondering, the reason I like to transfer this into a dish lined with paper towels is because as we press, some of those juices and excess fat will leak out. But anyway, let's go ahead and remove that foil and proceed to the official pressing method. And for that, what we'll do is cut a nice thick piece of cardboard, just a little smaller than the opening. And we will wrap that in foil. And we're going to use that to press down our pate as it sits overnight in the fridge. With the help of a little bit of weight. For example, a couple cans of garbanzos. Or something heavier might even work better. But the point is, make sure this is weighted down as it chills overnight in the fridge. So that the next day it's nice and firm and compressed. and looks something like this. And then what we'll do to unmold this is simply dip it very briefly in some very hot water. Just for a couple seconds. And that pate should slide right out. And we could start to slice, but for best results, I like to pop it back in the fridge until that bacon's nice and cold again. Right, when we slice, it should be firm and white like lardo and not flabby and translucent. So I did rechill mine, at which point we can slice in and see how we did. And as I was cutting this, I didn't even have to wait to taste it. I could tell by the way the knife was sliding through, the texture was perfect. And the appearance? Check it out. There is no way that could possibly look any better. Unless I guess we saw a few more pistachios. So I cut another slice, and there we go. That can't look any better. So visually, I was very happy with how this came out, and it looked like the real deal. But I needed to go in for a taste to make sure. And I served that up very traditionally with some cornichons and mustard and toasted bread. And as happy as I was with the appearance, I was even happier with the taste. All right, we joked about this just being a cold meatloaf, but because of all our rich meats and copious amounts of fat and salt, not to mention that little hint of gaminess from the liver, this goes so far above and beyond that in deliciousness, they really shouldn't have even been mentioned in the same video. I mean, taste, texture, appearance, I just enjoyed everything about this. So to summarize, there ain't no pate like a Chef John pate, because the Chef John pate don't stop until it's gone. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.